Hello and welcome to this evening's performance at Hatfield House. We're thrilled to be offering these concerts to you each Friday up until the 2nd of October. And they wouldn't have been possible without the support of all our friends and patrons and trusts. And so we're incredibly indebted to all of you for your support. We've given these concerts for free and we hope that you might consider donating to help us as we move further towards our 10th anniversary next year. We'd like to say how grateful we are to all the musicians for coming and performing and how happy we are to be supporting them through this difficult time. So we hope you enjoy. Thank you again for coming and we'll see you each Friday until the 2nd of October. In his painfully short lifetime, Franz Schubert managed to achieve a great deal. Not that he was given much credit for it, though, in his own lifetime. He was hardly known as a composer, particularly outside his native Vienna. And in fact, even then, he was only largely known for his songs and vocal works. When he died, a monument was erected with the words, Mankind has buried here a rich treasure, but still fairer hopes. There was this feeling that this man, who died after all at 31, would surely have achieved far greater things if he'd lived. What we now know, of course, is that he'd achieved much more than anybody thought. A fantastic range of vocal, orchestral, instrumental and chamber music. And at the heart of his output, well over 600 songs. If you think about a lifetime in which he was productive from the age of about 13 to 31, that's an awful lot of songs to be produced in a very, very short space of time. In fact, one of his friends, uh, Franz Meyerhofer, was insisted that he sh was sure that Schubert on one day had composed seven songs in succession, which is an indication of how fantastically productive he could be. Schubert's gift to song, however, was not just that he composed so many masterpieces in the song or lead form, but in the process he created almost a new kind of song. Up to this point, song, and particularly if you think about the prevailing the Italian opera of the time, the sound of the language is so mellifluous, so musical in itself, and all you have to do in a way is set it. You don't have to home in on individual words very often in the setting of Italian music because the, the language itself has this musical cascading quality that draws you, to, draws you in. What about German though? Almost all Schubert's songs are in German. And the German language is not a language we tend to think of today as being particularly musical. And yet, before Schubert's time, the greatest of all German writers Goethe had shown that the German language itself had its musical properties too and could inspire great poetry. And Schubert was intensely drawn to this. He was fascinated by the way that Goethe had released the musical properties of the language, but also that these were very different from the musical properties revealed in Italian. In German music, for instance, there tended to be a concentration on particular words and on the meaning of particular words. It's almost as though the music touches the word like the point of a needle. Or, to take a much later example from Viennese history, as though you're in a psychoanalysis session with Sigmund Freud and you're saying something and he just homes in on a particular word and says, oh, what do you mean by that? And there's a quality sometimes in Schubert's leader where you feel that's what he's doing. He's homing in on a particular word and saying, that word is the key to what this song is about. And they'll just point the harmony, twist it ever so slightly, or do something else, which just makes you realize the significance of that word. Even if you don't speak German, it can make your heart stop. And there is an extraordinary moment of this in one of the songs that we're going to be hearing, Gretchen am Spinrader, a setting of Goethe, which Schubert wrote at, wait for it, 15. It's a masterpiece. How a 15-year-old boy got inside the mind of an adolescent girl disappointed in love, I'll never know. But he does. And he does something extraordinary in this song. First of all, he creates a little undulating, rippling, repetitive sound on the piano figure, which is like the repetition of Gretchen's spinning wheel. She's spinning as she sings, as she remembers her encounter with Faust. But when she gets to the moment where she remembers his kiss, sein Kuss, 
the pattern stops for a moment and there's a silence and then it resumes and the song continues but that silence is absolutely devastating and the way it comes after those words sein kuss is kiss it's a moment of real psychological penetration to the heart of this and that's something that was to become vitally important in the great German leader tradition after Schubert, but also to become important in the song traditions of other languages too. The French language is very, very different from the, from the German language. It's a much more euphonious, melodic sound to listen to, that actually it's quite problematical to set. There are all sorts of sounds in French, like the ons and the us and everything, which don't lend themselves quite as well to musical setting as the vowel sounds of German, like lust or klar, words with which the vowel is very, very still and focused. So, a different kind of setting is required of French composers, and we'll see that in Berlioz's Le Captive. Berlioz was fascinated by German Romantic music, he was hugely inspired by it, but he attempted to turn it to a different kind of advantage in the French language. And in this, what he brings out is the drama of the French language, the declamatory drama. It's very powerful from that point of view, and requires very clear enunciation. However, Foray is another matter entirely. Foray is a very subtle composer. Foray never overstates anything. It's never ever too loud, you feel, with Foray. And yet he's able to convey the sense that underneath this civilized, amenable, very genial surface, there are deep feelings. And one of the ways he does that is, well, it has to be a French word in a way, doesn't it? Nuance the incredibly subtle shades of meaning that can come into a world, into a word. And each of these songs, these three songs, beautifully show that. Again, you don't have to understand the language to get the meaning behind the words. It's in the way he sculpts and plays with and paints the music around those French sounds that conveys the meaning so beautifully. And in the nocturne for piano before it, you can sense that even here, Foray is thinking in terms of the French language. You can imagine the sounds of that language to the beautiful melodic phrases that emerge in this. Foray was well known in his day as an organist, but he left no organ music of any note. One of the reasons was he didn't like the organ particularly. Uh, particularly, he didn't like the fact that it couldn't do that nuanced expression, which the piano so obviously could. And you'll hear that beautifully in the nocturne. Finally, an English composer, Roger Quilter, who is known only really for his songs these days, but who in other ways is just so fascinating. Well, he loved Schubert, he venerated Schubert, and was keen to see if there was a way that he could do what Schubert had done with the German language in the English language. Um, I, I, I love a story that once apparently Vaughan Williams went up to Quilter and said, why don't you write a symphony, Roger? They're ever so easy. But Quilter knew what he could and couldn't do, rather like Foray. Foray attempted very few grand theatrical, big orchestral works or that kind of thing. He knew that his genius was on the small scale, on the intimate scale, and Quilter is exactly the same. When he takes a uh, the poem like Tennyson's Now Sleeps the Crimson Petal, you can feel what he's learnt from Schubert about how to, which is the key word in this phrase, how do I home in it, how do I just twist the musical harmony or the texture to really bring out the meaning of that word. At the same time, he's a marvellous melodist like Schubert too. You don't feel you're being sort of nudged in the ribs to listen to a particular word. It's there, but it's also part of a beautiful unfolding melodic experience, which again is something you would say of 4A2. So these three composers belong to each other really rather nicely, even though the languages and the cultures they speak for are very, very different. It's an excellent little programme, and I do hope you enjoy it.
So this picture is a fete at Bourbonsy, and um, it has recently been reattributed to Marcus Goetz the Elder. Um, and, and this is for a number of reasons, but uh, based on comparison to his own artwork, um, but also especially because of a tiny little inscription that is in the lower left corner here, which is on that little sort of rock that this boy lies across. Um, and what seems to have happened is um, the picture was dedicated um, to someone and then given um, to the Cecils, and therefore they had to paint over the dedication and therefore lost the title of the artist, which after um, analysis um, and scanning and close looking, um, it, was it was found that the, the name was Marcus Gertz, um, the Elder. Um, and you can locate the picture because we have up here in the upper left um, the Tower of London. So this, believe it or not, is a scene from the South Bank of um, a, a wedding, a sort of almost like country wedding of um, sort of peasants dancing in the foreground and this procession here um, on the left coming from a church and possibly a self-portrait just of this man here leaning against the tree, looking back at the viewer with a very direct gaze, if you look very closely. And this has been compared to images of Marcus, and it seems comparable to his likeness, which is, is very a, exciting. There is a print I've seen which yeah. looks very light, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and it is also therefore linked to this other picture, which has you've bought yes. to join as a pair, which is um, of a village festival. Um, and so now you have two uh, festival fates, um, sort of probably based around marriage processions. So perhaps we'd better have a quick look at this one now yes, you've mentioned it. The so whereas the fate can be clearly positioned um, opposite the Tower of London across the river, this one um, looks like it might have been based on a more generic countryside scene. Mm. Um, it sort of has throwback to Bruegel's um, art of, of country peasants um, reveling and enjoying themselves with some rather kind of worn down country buildings and often a church nearby. Um, it's likely that this was done by the Marcus Gerhardt's workshop a little bit later than the fate, but it nonetheless has many very similar tropes and patterns that we can see repeated in terms of a few people's positions and a little, little motifs and details that are recurring, which is quite fun. You can see he was partial to certain images. If you look at all these different um, costumes, that you can tell what part of Northern Europe they come from. So the, there is another message in here as well. And he obviously very much enjoyed painting kitchens with spits and fire. <laughs> yeah. And you can see the same pies there, as you see in the Yeah, a, a different kind of wedding cake to the one we're familiar <laughs> exactly. with, but a wedding cake nonetheless, yeah. holding up um, different sprigs of herbs, which all had symbolisation that was um, yeah. linked to a marriage ceremony. But you're right about the costumes, and it seems that there was um, a link. The artist had seen images um, of European different national, national costumes right. by Lucas de Heer, and there yes, exist drawings, and there are yes. some very, very close um, costumes to these drawings. And in this picture, yes. there was clearly, yes, yes yeah. clearly some understanding um, of the different dress. Um, but you can see there's much variety. There's um, extremely fancy dress, and yeah. also very um, sort of informal, more peasant outfits. Um, but everyone's enjoying themselves, all in the same place.